this morning from uh, chapter 7 of John, the bulk of it, but, but I'm going to start and look at this verse. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. That's eternal destruction we're talking about. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. How foolish is the message of God considered, considered to a, a world that's I don't know if you turn on the news, it seems like everybody's mad at somebody. Have you noticed that? Isn't it interesting that the people that Jesus had the, the right to be the most mad at when He came down from heaven was actually the people that He wanted to save and would give His life to do it. You find that interesting? And, and, and there's other things about that. It, it's, it's foolish. You, you're foolish if you believe this thing called the Word. And whose opinion is that? Whose opinion is that? All of us, before we were saved, to a certain extent, maybe as a child you say, well, one day I will be, and you didn't think it was foolish. If, if, if you were raised in a home where people modeled it, then it didn't look as foolish. But when you step out in the world and you, you hear the news and you hear the, the people and all their opinions and all that kind of stuff, you find out that it pretty much to them is. It's foolish, for example, to go into school and believe that God created the heavens and the earth. You get about fourth grade, they start teaching you about what? Evolution. God didn't do this. Pond scum made you. <laughs> Two things bumped together and all of that because that is so much easier to believe. You know, a, a big bang happened and now we have padded chairs and air conditioning. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. How that happened? It, it's, it's so much easier to believe that two things bumped together instead of God, the Creator who loves you. And wants the best way you created an environment that would sustain you and, and, and offer you life and life abundant, life and life eternal. Right? So it becomes, and if you say that in class and it doesn't go with the grade that you're supposed to give and the teacher has to, to fill in that blank that they covered this chapter, then you're considered what? Foolish, radical, or, or something, just ignorant. You, they, they don't know science and stuff. Now, can the science prove all this stuff? If they could, they would quit calling it the theory, wouldn't they? Yeah, would. You know, but, but it is still a theory. Now, the, the, the point is, is not just that. How about, how about antiquated beliefs that, that us Christians have? Sex outside of marriage isn't healthy. It doesn't please God. It grieves people. It causes more problems. All those kind of things. But that's not what they teach on TV. Right? Uh, 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 killing the innocent it, it, it helps things <laughs> it helps people have better lives and if you say that I can't I'm going to be really mad <laughs> right but, but you're behind the times if you're not keeping up with the popularity of the world so listening to God and His way of doing things is foolish to a culture that doesn't want to believe in God and, and how do we know they don't want to believe in God well, if they didn't believe in God, would they get so mad when we talk about Him? And we've talked about that before. How many people get mad when we talk about Casper the Friendly Ghost? Do they get really upset? Do they start big old organizations and, and put uh, signs on buses about all those kind of things? And don't tell my kids about Casper. Do, do, they, do they do all that kind of stuff? No, they don't worry about it because they believe that Casper is fiction. But they believe that God that doesn't exist is powerful. Don't bring His name up. Does that make any sense? So, what we believe is considered foolishness to those who are not of God. Yet. Yet. And that's where we come in. Hope that God will use us to help them believe. They'll see something in us. The Holy Spirit will use us to witness, to do whatever. It's going to come from God, but we make ourselves tools to be used by God to keep them out of hell. Jesus allowed Himself to be the tool to use to pay for our sins, didn't He? Yeah. Right? The, the Bible says the propitiation. Don't say that in front of somebody's face. But, but that's, that's what it is. He, he became that, 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 that substitute for us that would die in our place and satisfy the rule that God made. The wages of sin is death. And He says, but I love you so much, I will pay it with my only begotten Son. Alright? That, that, that's where it's at. Alright. What does that have to do with going to camp this week, Brother Darrell? What does that have to do with Siloam's Fountain? What does that have to do with the river flowing? 
How does that all work together? I don't know if you know it. Camping, vacation, Bible school give me a lot of anxiety. Is it okay to say that out loud? Yeah. I would have the same kind of anxiety before school would start every year as a teacher. You know, I, 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 I can tell you, after I retired a couple of years, I went to a school and they had all the kids out in the hall and Sherry and I uh, walked all the way from one end of the school to the other. And by the time I got to the other end, because I thought of everything that could be going wrong in there and been an administrator for a while, that my nerves were shot. <laughs> Had to watch a ball game when my nerves just shot fried, you know, from, from all those kind of things, you know. And, and, and while I was doing it, it was a wonderful job and a wonderful calling to, to, to do, but after a while, sometimes your nerves just get gone. Anybody have that problem as we get older? Yeah. It, 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 it can get that way. And, and I think of everything that can go wrong at vacation Bible school. Can things go wrong? I think of a kid climbing on a chair and doing all kind of weird somersaults off the side, and it just... There go my nerves. You know, uh, all, all that kind of stuff that can happen. And I think of Dry Creek. You know it's hot in July, Dry Creek? D did you know some kids won't go to bed when it's time in Dry Creek? Did you know the cushions are about that thick until somebody as big as me gets on them and then there is no cushion? D did you know that? And yet, I, I went last year with the most dreaded group, the youths. The use. And as much as I dreaded it, and by the way, I was going. I was going. Why? And we have vacation Bible school, and I would hate to not have either one of those things. I would literally hate it because that's one of the most productive times in, in this church's life has been vacation Bible schools and that. And, and listen, preaching to save the saved, what good is that? I, I, I preach to you as the church. <laughs> I don't preach to you to come get saved again and again and again because it's one time is it, right? You're born again to eternal life. So we come and we get equipped to help the lost. And what a precious group we have in those kids. So why do we do it? The world is not going to tell them about Jesus. The world is going to make excuses for sin. The world is going to make it more comfortable to go away from God instead of come to God. The world is going to rationalize and, and say, you don't have to believe in a God that loves you and, and that you owe devotion to. Just believe in the science. You don't have to be loved by rocks bumping together. You don't owe them anything. They're just inanimate objects. You don't owe ponds come anything that life comes out of or, or whatever. And, and so on and so forth. The world won't teach them that. Where are they going to learn that? It's on every YouTube channel, right? Is it? Is you two teaching them about Jesus? Oh, no, not about Jesus. Uh, the other stuff, sure. Yeah. And, and fantastic things that we can't keep up with that make the superheroes bigger and all that kind of stuff. And, and they decide what moral is moral and what is not. If you two is not teaching them about Jesus. Right? And anything else that, 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 that they come on. So we get the chance. But when I think about Dry Creek, it's particularly, I think it's a Bible school to, to a little extent, but at, at Dry Creek, for the Probably out of the last 20-something years, I've probably made 16 or so. There was a little time that I had to work in the summers and I couldn't go. But something strange happens. I get a bunch out of it. It changes me for a week. What's the difference? Well, there's no TVs. All right? And, and the people that you go around when you go to one of the, the group meetings or whatever, they're praying for each other. And I go as a teacher, so I'm in the Word five days a week. And we're supporting one another in sharing the Word. And you see these precious kids and you see God changing them. And you don't think that has an effect on you? And you see some precious kids that may not have been churched ever to find out anything. When I say church, I mean learn about Jesus at all. And you realize what a miracle it is that here they are at this place. And so I get pulled out of the world for a week. And guess what? Preachers still live in the world. Amen? Yeah. Particularly when I was working every day. Right? But something happens. We've done some labor renewals and stuff here. 
And in three days, it's amazing how much it can literally change you to be immersed in, 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 in God's spiritual work in front of you all of that time. And when I thought about that in the Bible, I, I thought about the, 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 the Festival of Booze. Anybody know about that? Feast of Tabernacles is called. You aware of that? Well, it, it happens in the Jewish calendar uh, uh, in it's about October. It's at the end of the season. But what happens is people come and to commemorate the time that they left uh, um, Egypt. Slavery in Egypt, the Hebrew people. Remember they crossed the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness? And, and it took them 40 years because their own detours, spiritual detours, so God gave them a physical detour. It took them 40 years to do a three or four week trip. Uh, somebody might know men that don't ask directions. But, but, but they had a, a, a powerful GPS. God's powerful spirit guiding them. But it reminded them of the time in, in those, to remember what it was like to be camping all the time. And God providing what they needed. Did God provide on that trip? He provided clothing that wouldn't rot. He provided water from dry rocks. You want to see something happen from a rock that brings life? The water from the rock did. And He brought food. The manna, and after a while, they brought the quail for the, the, uh, the meat that they cried about. Of course, guess what? How much the people appreciated it? For about two days. Right? And then they got over their appreciation. Do we do that? Are we bad for that with God? He's as good as our next crisis sometimes. Do we treat him that way? And that's not okay. But, but God did what? He said, at the end of every year, I want you to come back and give me these booths or. or little brush huts, generally three-sided, and live in those for a week. And, and we're going to honor God through that. And you know what comes off with that? Well, how much money do you make? What team are you rooting for? Uh, everything else, uh, you know, uh, you had, what was your status in society? Uh, how much education you get? All that goes away because everybody's in a what? <laughs> a little brush arbor, a little, little uh, a brush camp. Everybody's the same. There's no bigger RVs or littler RVs. There's just a bunch of brush stuff made. Just like they would be camping as they went across. And who were they to focus on at that time? God. And you know, they get changed. They start appreciating things that God's got. That God's got for them. And so I think about that. So chapter 7 of John talks about apparently the, the last one Jesus was at in, in His body. The last Feast of Booths. And, and kind of think of that as we go through. We're going to go through the first part uh, fairly quick to give a summary, and at the end we're going to focus on some things, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for loving us. Help us to remember to be grateful. Lord, thank You for the opportunities where we do get to take a vacation from this world and, and just be immersed in, in Your Spirit and Your work and Your mission. Thank You for these kids that You're going to send and every adult, Father. We pray, Lord, just extra grace, uh, and Father, to... To, to make the, I don't want to call it magic, Father. Maybe magic's too cheap a word. But Lord, to experience your, your total grace and supernatural strength to, to, to get through and, and, and your abilities, even through us, Lord, limited humans. Father, with you, there's no limitation to what you can do, even through us. So, Father, we thank you for that. And I pray, Father, that your message comes through loud and clear today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I, I, I see churches that. Uh, take their kids, and sometimes they do fundraising, sometimes they do this and that. Since I've been here, before I got here, 23 years ago, this church said, if you can pay the upfront money, I think it's up to 30 bucks now, the, the rest of the 200 and something dollars, the church funds. And how many fundraisers, if you've been here a while, have we done to, to raise money for those kids? Nothing. We put money in here for the mission, don't we? It comes from the hearts of the people. But I remember when I got here, when we were struggling for, to make ends meet and all in, in the double wide out front, God provided. It's kind of like when He built this building. God provided the funds. Where did they come from? You can only say God. God just made it happen. When we needed money, the offerings went up. When we didn't need money, the offerings go down. It's funny that way. He gave sufficient to the need for the day. And so I remember part of the money that came in was from a local farmer who didn't go to church at that. But he tithed on his crop every year and it paid for the camp funds for the kids to go. Now what came first? The offer for the kids to go without having to, to, to work for it or, or the money? 
God had the provision way ahead of that. And, and since then, he, he's, he's passed away, he moved away, and all that kind of stuff. But it's, that's carried on. It's always been, if you want to go... Now, the, the other thing that's interesting is there's no church affiliation necessary. We've never turned somebody away and said, no, you don't belong to this church or this and that for these kids. Why? Who do we want to go hear about Jesus? The kids who won't get to hear about it anywhere else. Amen? And, and if you know about the kids today, sometimes you recognize them, they've got a little square tan line in their face. You know what I'm talking about? And because it, it's a whole lot more entertainment than reality. There's no restriction. They'll tell you you can do anything that you want and all that kind of stuff. Is that real life? No. It, it's not. So these things, they kind of go to the side and, and, and everything that, they, that comes with them. But at the same time, they're being filled with people who love them, care about them, will go and sleep on a mattress as big, etc., etc., and a group that, 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 that puts their heart and their treasure where their heart is and for the kids to make it happen. It's really amazing. I've been there in one night out of 400 kids that 100 kids prayed to receive Christ individually. Not all in at me and count the hands. It individually, carefully counts. By the way, if you have to convince a kid to accept Jesus, they're not ready. It's got to be something that the Holy Spirit's done in their heart and confirmed. And that's very carefully done. If you have to coach it, now say this, now say that, they're not ready. Does that make sense? Because you're lying to them if you tell them something that, that you, you got them to, to, to ver verbalize. Okay? So th those are things that you have to be careful. But I watched 101 now. You think that wasn't a powerful move by the Holy Spirit? 25% of the 400 kids there? It, it really uh, amazing stuff that goes on. Well, in John chapter 7, it says this. We're going to go through these first verses as quickly as I can. Jesus went to Galilee with, uh, to stay out of Judea because the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. He's, he's been ministering for those three years now, and, and, and this is the fall, and, and in the springtime will be Passover, and that's when he's going to pay the price for us. So we're in the fall. Soon he came... It was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. Booze. Here we go again. First two, please. Verse two. Okay. It was time for the festival of booze. Okay, so we know we're, we're in October. Verse three. This is interesting. And Jesus' brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. And I'm putting the emphasis on that, that little thing. Why did I say it that way? Verse 4. They're still messing with him. Do brothers do that to brothers? Can you imagine being Jesus' brother? Younger brother? What did he ever do wrong? Yeah. If there was an, ever a goody two sandals, it was Jesus, right? He couldn't do anything wrong. And do you think that the younger brothers resented him? Who was the mama's pet? Because she could depend on him. If mom said be back, it, it had to be that way. And the others are, are, are humans without that kind of heart. And so they're looking for ways to go around authority, aren't they? Do you know any kids like that? you know any adults like that? You know, and, and, and so all of that's taking place. So it says, uh, go, go back a verse or two. Back to four. Back to four. There you go. Uh, you can't become famous if you hide like this. They're messing with you. Does it sound like little brothers to you? If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. And then verse five tells why they're saying it that way. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Is that crazy? I mean, Jesus is about 32 years old. His brothers are probably in their 20s. And Jesus has modeled perfectly for them all of his life, all of their lives in front of them. And they don't believe in him. Could, could they have had a better witness? Absolutely not better. Which tells us what? 
One thing, in your own power, you're not going to lead anybody to the Lord. Did you know that? Your, your arguments, your perfect presentation, your, your this or your that, in your own power, it's not going to happen. They had the perfect one there in front of them to show them what it was like to, to, to love God perfectly. And, and it didn't happen that way, did it? And Jesus told him, said, now's not the right time for me to go, but you can go anytime. They didn't have the same responsibility and the same calling, did they? Said, verse 7, The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. Did you know that when you hold a, a, a standard, people aren't going to love you quite the same way? They're going to what? Resent you. If you do everything perfect, they're going to say, oh, I am so glad to be around someone who is so perfect. <laughs> because how does it make them feel? A, a whole lot less than... So after saying those things, he, he stuck around there. Now, what was going on at the festival? Well, they were concerned about Jesus. The, the leaders were. We already know they were trying to kill him, but they pretended that they weren't. Do politicians act like that? Talk out of both sides of their mouths? And these are religious politicians. So if there's anybody sanctimonious, it's these. When I say religious, I don't mean God lovers. I mean they're playing a game with religion. That they keep sitting in power. So the Jewish leaders tried to find him at the festival and kept asking everybody, Where's Jesus? Where's Jesus? There's a lot of grumbling about him. No one had the courage to speak favorably about him. Why not? You would have been labeled. You would have been one of those foolish ones, one of those who are, are trying to mess with people's heads and getting to believe in a different reality than the political culture of the day wanted to. But midway through the week, verse 14. Midway through the week, Jesus went to the temple and began to teach. He just showed up. I mean, you think about that. They were all ready and all waiting for Him to come. And Jesus shows up and now He's teaching. And He teaches in such a way they don't get. People were surprised when they heard Him. He says, how does He know so much? Where was He trained at? And He said, my message it isn't coming from me, but the one who sent me. Remember, he's the perfect human. If you want to be the perfect human, who's got to work through you? It's got to be God Almighty, right? And, and Jesus was a perfect, the word's conduit. Uh, you know what conduit is? If you've got pipe bringing water into your house, that's the conduit that the water comes in from. Okay? The pipe doesn't make water. The pipe allows the water to flow through. We, we need to be a conduit. We don't make the miracles. We, we allow God to do that. Was there any restrictions on God using God in the flesh, Jesus, to, to go through? No, there was no sin. Do you and I offer restrictions to God for Him to use us? Absolutely. Does our opinion ever get in the way? Does our emotions ever get in the way? Does our des illicit desires ever get in the way? All the time, don't they? Does what we think, when we lean upon our thoughts instead of God's thoughts, that stops God's perfect message from, from coming through us. So He says, my message much is uh, not my own. Okay, verse 19. Verse 19 says, As the Scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. What, what is he talking about? I work towards Corinthians. Go, go back to uh, John, verse 19. It says, Moses gave you the law. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin is not telling me I got a phone call. He's giving me a, a device that should work a little better. Uh, now I have to learn to use his. It may be where, where we're located, Kevin. All right. Number 19, please. It 
says, Moses gave you the law, but none of you obey it. In fact, you're trying to kill me. Now, he said it out loud. Everybody knew it, but he said it out loud. And the crowd says, well, you're demon-possessed. That's not really what's happening. You know, uh, we don't get it. But, but in verse 25, look what it says. Some of the people, just the people that were running around in the crowd there, a lot of people there, everybody was supposed to come in. The males were all supposed to come in for the Feast of Booths. Some of the people living in Jerusalem uh, started to, to ask each other, isn't this the man they were trying to kill? How, how big a secret was it, was it that these religious leaders were trying to kill Jesus? The average Joseph or, or whoever knew it. Right? They, they, they knew it in the crowd. It, it, it said, but here he is speaking in public. And there's nothing, and they say nothing about it. Could our believers believe he's really the Messiah? Is this a confused bunch that showed up to this place? Remember, Jesus came in the middle, he starts teaching, and people start listening, believing, and, and they know the background rumors and stuff that the, they're trying to get rid of him. But they're not doing nothing, and so they're confused. And meanwhile, the religious leaders are kind of going crazy. They, they don't know what to do with this Jesus. It says, verse 30, Then the leaders tried to arrest Him. But no one laid a hand on Him because His time had not yet come. God is not going to let it happen until the perfect time. What was going to be the perfect time? The perfect time is going to be on a Passover. What does that mean? Remember what happened in the Passover, the original one? When they, when they freed the people, they were to, to kill a lamb, and the lamb was going to be put on the doorpost, and the angel of death was going to pass over that house. There wouldn't be death at that house. That was Passover. So the killing of the Passover lamb would, would show that there are something dying. Remember, the wages of sin is death. Death has to be paid. But the gift, that word but, I like how Doug said it this morning. When God says but, it's not, it's not like us saying, God, I would do that, but... <laughs> you know, not, not that one. When God says but, it's an intervention for us. So, the way he says is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus says what? That lamb. That sacrificial lamb by the, that atoning, meaning it covered our sin. The death gets paid so that we get to go free. So it had to be on Passover day. It wouldn't be in October. It would be what we would call the Easter time. Okay? That, that's what it's talking about. Alright, so they, they're trying to get it, but it wasn't time yet. Many among the crowds at the temple believed in Him. Uh-oh. How's that going to deal with the religious group? When I say religious, you think political in that, in that band. Think politics. There's two parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. One doesn't even believe in a resurrection. You know, and the other is so legalistic so that they can stay in power and boss everybody around. That, 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 that's where they're at. So, but the people believed. After, uh, many among the crowd believed. After all, they said... Would you expect the Messiah to do more miracles than this guy's done? He's done it. He's proved it. How many times has somebody got to do something right before you trust them? How many times has somebody got to do something right before you trust them? Is it generally speaking that, that our kids, when they're this big and they trust mom and dad or, 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 or granny and papa to, to do the right things, when do they start losing that trust? When do they start losing that trust? When, when they're growing up. Hopefully, and by the way, grown up can sometimes mean 60 plus years old. But when they're growing up, what happens to teenagers? They know it all. They've got a brain. They've got new freedoms. They've got new ways to figure things out. And they think it's way better than the restrictions that mom and dad have had. And so they trust their new feelings instead of who? The ones who have cared for them since whenever. And that's normal. It's just trickier to guide them through that time as they get older and have more freedoms in, in so many different ways, right? So, the, the crowd is, is getting unruly and they're not trusting these Pharisees who really like to tell them how bad they are as much as they can. So that they, they give all of their allegiance to them. Now, what has Jesus done wrong to the crowds before Nothing. He's shown the power of God and the loving hand of God and the forgiveness of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God. And, and so suddenly He's becoming more popular to the crowd. Jesus told them, I'll only be with you a little longer then you're not going to be able to find Me. 
And they were, of course, puzzled by all that. What does he mean? Then we come to verse 37. This is where we're through with the introduction. Verse 37. What happened in verse 37? It's the last day of the festival. I don't know if you know it, but what they told about the festival of Booths was going to be, the Jewish people added more to it. Kind of like they told the basic laws and the Jewish people added a whole lot more. It wasn't a bad thing they added. They added a water festival. Now how many of y'all are thinking water slides and water parks? That's not what we're talking about here. They added a, 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 a ceremony about water. And what they would do, now remember in the desert, water is life. They would go down from the temple to Siloam's fountain. Fountain, fountain, fountain. Y'all heard that key word that we sang about earlier? And, and Siloam's fountain was, was down below. You have to go down, if you're in Jerusalem, you go down some steps and you get all the way down there. This is a place where it uh, had healing water, so to speak. And the priests would go and they would gather the, the, the water and they would bring it up to a place by the altar and they would pour it. Now, if you're in the desert and you're pouring water out, you must have a lot of water. You don't waste water like that. But, but this particular ceremony, the people would be worshiping during the process. Some would drink uh, water down at that well from, from under the ground that where you where you'd go to that cavern to, to get that water. And, and, and they would drink. And, and, and so There was one author that they wrote down, if you don't know the joy of participating in this, then you don't know joy. That's pretty strong words, isn't it? If you don't know the joy... So this was a major, major thing that they did. And they did it on the last day. Remember, he got there at the middle, but now he's at the last day. The climax of the festival. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anybody who's thirsty... Come to me. I hate to point at me talking about Jesus. Jesus said, come to me. Why? What was that water pointing to? In the desert, who gave water from a rock? Who, who said uh, to the woman at the well, uh, if, you, if you come get your water from me, I'm, I have living water, and you'll never need it again? You won't thirst anymore for that kind of water, this living water that gives life e eternal. So he says, anyone thirsty can come up. When does he do it? At the day of the water celebration. By the way, that's better than water slides. Eternal life through Jesus. It says, anyone who believes in me may come and drink, for the Scriptures declare, this is, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. We sing a song about let the river flow. Where did they get those words from to write that song? Rivers of living water will flow from His heart. Whose heart? The Messiah. The one who's come to rescue. Now they're all confused. Who is this Jesus? And He's saying, I'm here. I am the living water. I've got life to give you. I'm the Redeemer. I'm the Messiah. I'm your Savior. Does that make the political religious people happy? No. But how about those that believe? we found some already, haven't we? Now, how do we know that we're talking about that? Well, look at the next verse, verse 39. When he said living water, he was speaking about the Spirit. Holy Spirit, come. As we sang in that song, Holy Spirit, come. Right? So, this, this term for living water represents the Holy Spirit coming from God. Well, Christians, when does the Bible say you receive the Holy Spirit? I'm... He is the Lord. He, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, this is God. Shows up in three ways. Amen? Holy Spirit, come and move in power. Is God powerful? But when does the church receive the Holy Spirit? When you confess Him as your Lord. How do I know that? Ephesians uh, 1.13 says it. When you believe, the Holy Spirit comes and seals you. If this is God, how powerful is that? So, we're talking about that there. Now, John did his own commentary there. He said, I know you don't know what I'm talking about when I said the water, living water and all that kind of stuff. So he says it. When, when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit who would be given to everyone believing in Him. Believing in Him as what? Lord and Savior. Remember, confess with your mouth, Jesus is your Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised Him from the dead and you shall be saved. That's what the Bible says. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not entered into His glory. It's not quite time yet, but it's coming. Not long, just a few months. 
Right? When the crowds heard him say this, some of them said, Surely this is the prophet we've been expected. But others said, He's the Messiah. Still others said, He can't be the Messiah from Galilee. How could that be? And then they said, For the Scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of the royal line of David in Bethlehem. That's from Micah, by the way. The village where King David was born. So this can't be because he's from Galilee. How many of y'all are snickering because you already know that they were mistaken? Why were they mistaken? Where was Jesus born? Bethlehem, the city of David. Right? You know that. Did they know that? Did they have the New Testament yet? They didn't know that. So they're making their statement that's the difference between life and death relying on their ignorance. <laughs> Have you ever had a lost person try to tell you who God really is? That He's mean? That He just doesn't want you to have fun? That He's got too many rules? Have you ever heard somebody that doesn't know Scripture tell you those things? That He's fake? <laughs> That's kind of strange because what name did God choose for Himself? He's the great what? I am. I am. So is He fake? No. no, He says I am. Right? But it's foolishness to a world that's headed for destruction. The crowd was divided. Some wanted him arrested, but nobody laid a hand on him. When the temple guard returned without having arrested Jesus, the Pharisees had already sent him out to find something. They could always find something on somebody to arrest them. And they got back. The leading priest and Pharisee says, Why didn't you bring him in? We've been trying to get rid of this aggravating fellow. Jesus is aggravating to those that don't know God. Did you know that? He reminds us when we step the wrong way. And that's an irritation. Now, if you were going on following a treasure map and, and you got off course and somebody said, no, 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 you're going to miss the treasure. Get back over there. Would you be aggravated with them? Or would you say, thank you for telling me. I don't want to miss the treasure. You see the difference? If you trust Jesus, then you trust when He's moving you back. He's doing it because He loves you and He doesn't want you to miss His best. But they didn't see Jesus that way. They saw Him as what? Somebody just irritated. Messing with the status quo, the way things are, what made them comfortable. Why didn't you bring Him in? And, and here's what the guards say, the ones that went out to get Him. We've never heard anyone speak like this. The guards responded. And so what did the Pharisees say? Oh, really? Tell me more. No, that's not what they said. What did they say? Have you been led astray? Oh, how foolish you are. I added that second part. Right? But what are they trying to do? When our kids who, who come in and give their heart to Jesus come in and, and say, I'm ready to trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And they go to school and say, I trust Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And, and what is the teacher who can't even talk about religion? Their hands are tied. If they're a good person, they say, okay, we can't talk about that here. Or do they say, nope, science says this. And by the way, which scientist do they choose to believe? The one that backs up whoever wrote the book or whatever. Now, I don't know if you know it, science books are not infallible. They're not typically inspired by the Holy Spirit, by God, right? Some good information. How many of you are glad that your doctor took science class? Okay? But, but some have different agendas. And, and sometimes when it becomes political, you never know which way it's going to go. Said, have you been led astray? They mocked. Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believes in Him? Now, you've already read the rest of John, so you're snickering again, aren't you? Why did that first group miss? Because they didn't have full knowledge. Have you ever noticed, Christians, that sometimes after you more maturing as a Christian, when you don't have an answer, you still trust God that the answer is going to be there. And then later you find it say, ah, thank you God for showing me that. Now why do you trust Him when you haven't even seen it yet? That He's going to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow and His promises are going to be upheld and He's not going to break them in the middle. Why do you trust Him at that point? You must have a pretty good track record. You have received the Holy Spirit. Well, how do you know you've received the Holy Spirit? Go do something wrong and see if you don't get a nudge. Go plan to do something wrong and see if you don't get a nudge. Why does He nudge you? That's called conviction, by the way. Why does He do that? He's there. 
let you know because He loves you. You're His. You represent His name. Will He absolutely stop you? Not generally. Then you get to do the what? The learning lesson. The object lesson to, to move forward. So, is there a single one of them? Who is that one that, that's there? We're going to talk about him later. John's going to bring him up. Who is he that, who, who's the Pharisee that knows that went to Jesus by night because he didn't want to be slammed by his friends? Nicodemus, remember? This foolish crowd follows him. Remember the foolish people following Jesus? But they're ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. Then Nicodemus, the leader who, who, who had met with Jesus earlier, he said, is it legal to convict a man before you even having a hearing? Y'all decided he's guilty and y'all haven't given him due process. What's, what's Nicodemus trying to do? Slow down the lynch mob. He's not jumping out and saying, lynch me with him. He's trying to slow them down, isn't he? The people say, get rid of him quick because they're playing, they're conniving in the back. So guess what? There was somebody in that crowd who was a Pharisee who did believe in Jesus. So yes, there is one to answer that was question. Is there, is there anybody from, from the learned group that, that trust? Yeah, Nicodemus did. And what did they do with him? What does Satan do to, to get rid of people who witness against God? They try to annihilate them. Make fools out of them. Call them foolish. Call them names. Say, you don't fit in here. You're not as smart as us. Something like that. They replied, are you from Galilee too? <sighs> You're from that little place? That bunch of ignorant people, that's who you are? Do politicians do that? Do they call the people in somebody's other party they don't like? Do they come up with names for them? That put them down? It's famous... Uh, 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 election or two back, the deplorables or, or whatever came about. Yeah. And, and you know, the names get slung all around to try to do what? Discredit. To discredit. So, it's one of Satan's good tricks. I say good, being very facetious. They said, search the Scriptures for yourselves and see no prophet ever comes from Galilee. That's kind of funny. Why? <coughs> Who's the guy with the well? Jonah. Jonah came from Galilee. Uh, Hosea came from Galilee. There's one more from, from that group. And then there's two more that's kind of famous. Elijah and Elisha came from Galilee. So, will Satan misquote Scripture? All the time. Does he know Scripture? Absolutely. Right? And, and that's why he counterfeits it. That's why he counterfeits it. How does all this go together? We're taking kids to a place that the world doesn't have its undue influence on. For, for just four days. And, and they're going to get to, I pray here, directly from the Holy Spirit, through other people who are praying and focusing on, on God's will being done. And hopefully, they're going to be equipped in God's Word. Remember what happens when they misinterpret the Word? And you might believe that argument, no, no prophet comes from up. But if you know the Word, you say, oh yeah, well, I know there's about five of them that came from Galilee. I can't trust you. I can trust Jesus. He doesn't lie to me, but you just did. And you're supposed to be the experts. Are, are they going to get called names at camp? No. A child of God. Or a would-be child of God. Uh, the, the camp manager said one day, said, I can tell you this, everybody that comes to camp won't be changed, but they will all be loved. He says, that's what we can guarantee. They're going to be loved. You know, no matter what else happens, that that's going to take place. And they'll get that news. Is that what our kids are going to get from you too? Or from a school run by people who can't talk about Jesus, but can talk about everything else? And when I say everything, turn on the news and just see what they can talk about, what they're trying to get in there, how horrible a country they live in. Uh, God didn't know what He was doing when He made your gender. Uh, on and on and on and on. You can talk about that to five-year-olds apparently at school. Right? I'm a school teacher. And wonderfully, you've got school teachers out there that filter a bunch of that junk out. Thank God, Father, and pray for those Christian teachers, especially in the public schools to protect our kids. But for a little while they go out. And then what happens? They're equipped better to go back into the world. The unsaved who may get saved and the saved so that when they come, oh, that's foolishness. 
And they can smile and say, I understand why you think that. But guess what? It's the power of God in me to have life and life eternal and to offer it to you. Are the people going to get it yet? Did Jesus' brothers get it yet? No, it took a move of God to open their heart and then somebody to tell them. By the way, a couple of Jesus' brothers, you might have heard of. One was Jude and one was James. Uh, if you don't know their names, they're right here in the back of the book. There's some little books written in there. Did they get saved? Apparently so. God had a lot in Scripture, didn't He? Right? So, how many of you are happy lost people can be saved? How many of us are unhappy saved people can be taught to live like lost? Can that happen? Our job is to do what? Give them an environment where they can grow and get inoculated with, with the Holy Spirit, with the Word, with, with a support group so that they can go and face these things and become, become what? Wonderful tools for God to use to help more people get to Him. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord, I know I'm talking mostly to the church here. This is a message for the church. But what does it take to be saved, church? What, what do we need to be able to tell them at any point? If, if there's a fire, you tell them, don't, if you catch on fire, stop, drop, and roll. What, I, I tell them Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, He's your leader, your Lord, and you believe in your heart, He was really raised from the dead. He died for your sins. And God accepted that offering of His life. And we know that because He rose Him from the dead. So if you confess with your mouth, He's your Lord, and believe God rose Him from the dead, you shall be what, church? Saved. Saved from what? Hell. Saved to what? Heaven and life eternal. And the rest of us, even when it's not comfortable, who's going to take a stand for Christ? It may be a stand where Nicodemus was, where he wasn't ready to die on that hill yet because God had other things for him to do. Right? But it may be the stand like Jesus to do what you would need to do. By the way, it wasn't at that time. He didn't go up there and say, go ahead and kill me. I know you want to. It had to be in whose time? Seek the will of God for that right time. Amen? Let's pray.